Thus far, I'm very pleased to have been able to present the first two parts of my conversation with Colonel Mike Snook on the myths and misconceptions of the Battle of Islanduana, totaling some two and a half hours. These have covered various aspects of Zulu deployments and actions, as well as those of the British forces. In this video, we'll conclude the discussion and examine jamming rifles, the outcome of the battle and alternate tactical options, the Welshness of the 24th foot, the legacy of Islanduana and works drift as it pertains to the modern regiment, and Colonel Snook's current projects. As with the preceding chapter, this is in fact a re-recording of the discussion, which was done due to technical difficulties resulting in very poor audio. Many thanks must be extended to the good Colonel for sitting down and revisiting the material. So the next point that I'd like to ask you about, it deals with, uh, with, with this. Of course, uh, the viewers of the channel will be quite familiar, as well as your readers will be familiar with the, Mar the Martini Henry. Um, another reason often cited for the, well, in the popular conception anyway, of one of the reasons the battle was lost was due to, well, that article not performing as it should in the sense that it jammed uh, that this was a constant and a most significant problem. Uh, have you discovered any evidence that the Martini Henry as a, as a system, as a rifle failed? And, and if there weren't any issues or they, there was no evidence of this, then perhaps maybe a comment on where the myth or the misconception of jamming rifles comes from. Um, it doesn't come out of history books or primary documents relating to the Zulu War, particularly. Um, where it does rear its head is in anything to do with the Sudan. Uh, but of course, those are completely uh, different operating environments uh, in the Sudan. Sand, sand, rifles, oil, working parts, mechanisms, bad juju. Um, so uh, th there's a problem with uh, the extractor um, in the, in, I think, in the Mark I uh, variant of the weapon. But you're drawing me onto ground with which you are more familiar than, than I. Um, so the, I think the extractor is at some point uh, toughened, uh, but I, or, or, or stiffened, or what, what is the right word? Strengthened, I think, would be the word. Stre strengthened, stiffened. I like <laughs> um, um, so it's anyway, it's fitted with a with an improved extractor. So there's a bit of an issue there. Um, uh, but the way where you get serious problems with stoppages is is in the Sudan. Of course, that's six years later, uh, and it crops up particularly in the context of the Battle of um, Abu Khair. Uh, where many of the uh, men involved uh, were actually cavalrymen who who didn't really uh, who hadn't been brought up on the on the long Martin Henry rifle to begin with, and may not have known all the sort of fiddly little infantry tricks about keeping your weapon in in uh, full working order in difficult conditions because you know the cavalry, with great respect to them, didn't take firearms uh, in the heyday age of cavalry, men on horses, didn't take firearms that seriously in the same way that, that, that the infantry did. But it, within the context of the Camel Corps at that time, quite a lot of the contingents were, were made up of cavalrymen. And there was a terrible problem with jamming rifles uh, in the Sudan. But that's a separate subject. Uh, you know, it's, it's not related to Zululand, where there is no suggestion, uh, really, that there was any significant problem with, with jamming. Of course, of course, there were jams, all rifles jam, but not, um, you know, in, as, a, as a thing, as an issue. Uh, and in particular, if you look at the uh, defense of Rourke's Drift, where huge volumes of ammunition were fired, by a small number of firers, most of whom survived, you do not find their accounts of Rorkshift um, littered with allusions to 
uh, stoppages. Uh, I think Henry Hook might mention one <coughs> from the top of my head, uh, but but it, it doesn't come up as a as an issue. It's not a it's not a thing. And if it was going to happen, if it was an issue relating to this war at this time with this mark of the weapon, then where where what better test conditions could you have than the defense of Warp Drift on the same day, 10 miles away, um, by soldiers of the same regiment with exactly the same rifle. You know, so you don't get huge problems with stoppages at Warp Drift. Why, therefore, would there have been a huge problem with stoppages at Isanwana? And actually, it's quite easy to clean, to clear a stoppage um, with, in, the, in the Martini uh, simply by using the um, uh, the uh, cleaning rod um, to impel it down the barrel and, it, and it'll knock the cartridge uh, back out of the breech with no great difficulty. Um, if, if the whole damn thing clogs up, you, you know, it's not, not as straightforward, but um, no, we, uh, the, the, as I say, based on, on uh, the reports of Rorschach, there, there's, there's no serious history to suggest that it was a problem at the Sandwana. Uh, you know, but people, people make things up. <laughs> Not to put too fine a point on it. Um, in terms of perhaps, uh, you know, obviously people making things up, do you think that, um, I understand uh, in my readings that there was some specific examples attributed to Durnford and his troops of him, yeah. you know, his troops handing uh, them yeah. the, their rifle for him to sort of clear stoppages. Uh, yeah. Do you think that that may have been extrapolated onto the greater context in some way, shape, or form? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, that, that's the way, as, as we've already discussed, these things happen. You know, that little grain of truth. Uh, actually, we're talking about untrained uh, people who are not professional soldiers dealing with a weapon other than the Martini Henry. Um, and, and yes, they, they, you know, in some instances they had stoppages. Probably their rifles weren't as clean as they might ideally have been, or their carbines weren't as clean as they might ideally have been. They may have, um, because they're using it out of uh, ammunition, out of bandoliers, may have uh, possibly have a, a, a accumulated verdigris, which you get with a leather bandolier on a, on a brass cartridge. <coughs> that can cause stoppage. I think that was a problem some of the American um, units in, uh, on their western frontier, uh, the use of cartridge belts in that fashion, um, with the Springfield carbine. But I, I could, I'm probably venturing into dangerous ground because I'm not an expert in the American uh, frontier. Um, but uh, no, you're, you're quite right to mention that. There, there is this idea of, um, I, th I think it's, it's sort of like a, a good story of, of um, you know, people turning around to Durnford, who's only got one arm to begin with, and he's sort of holding a carbine between his knees and clearing the stoppage with his one good hand. Well, he may have done that <coughs> sufficiently often for somebody to have noticed and, and for to have written it down, but he probably didn't spend the entire Battle of Isandwa <laughs> clearing stoppages <laughs> for, for his private soldiers. You know, that's not what colonels do. Uh, he might have humoured one or two and said, oh, for God's sakes, give it here. <laughs> but, but, but that's the limit of it. So. Right. But it makes a good story and it spreads and it proliferates and it becomes becomes a myth. Uh, as that indeed has proliferated a great deal. <laughs> We've, uh, with the, the ammunition and, and the jamming rifles uh, points in particular, we've dealt with some sort of more global sort of myths and misconceptions. Um, a, a lot of, especially in the modern internet age, the discussions coalesce around the sort of coulda, shoulda, woulda, <clears throat> to quote a phrase. Um, perhaps uh, under the topic perhaps, of, of the actual outcome of the battle and possible alternate tactical options um, would be sort of a, a way to segue into this part of the discussion. Um, perhaps the most popular reason for the excuse uh, of the British defeat uh, lies in the deployment and the formations they used on that day. If we take out the ammunition and the jamming rifles and all those other things. So much in the same sort of plane as to 
reasons, quote unquote, uh, that are put to the defeat. Um, I was wondering if you could might lend some clarity on the validity of the claim uh, that other formations used on that day would have staved off defeat as such, perhaps uh, a square or other close order formations, laggering the, wa the wagons um, or holding the top of a nearby hill or any, any number of these types of things. Is there anything else that they could have done in, to stave off defeat? Yeah, well, the, um, <clears throat> the, the mission is the point, as it were. Uh, and the mission in this case is to defend the camp at Nisandwana, which, um, not through the fault of anybody who's actually involved in defending it, but through the fault of um, Major Clary, principally, who lays it out, and Lord Chelmsford, who does nothing about its layout subsequently, is um, an extremely uh, elongated and spread out uh, position. So it's, it is very much uh, cited for camping, not for defence, uh, which is generally not encouraged in military circles. <laughs> the defence should uh, really be afforded rather higher priority, but that's not what he did. And he, he laid out this great big camp. It was very neat, nice straight lines of tents, but not particularly defensible. But once you get into that position where the whole thing is all sort of uh, luxurious and spread out, then it has to be, it is still the camp and it has to be defended. So you're really creating a problem for yourself. And the particular problem <clears throat> and, what, and why this goes quite so horribly wrong is that when um, Clary laid out the camp on the, I think it was the 20th or the 21st, wrecked it and then waited for the troops to arrive, showed them to the right spot, um, when he did that, when he undertook that exercise, he was imagining there being two complete battalions of the 24th, plus supporting troops, to defend that camp. It was a camp for 12 companies of regimentary to defend, not six. So that, there's a problem. Uh, you've got half as many men because of Lord Chelmsford's decision to, to go out with the Second Battalion to Mangani, you know, half as many men as Major Clary, who works for Colonel Glynn, uh, expected there to be available in the camp to defend it if it came to it. So um, there aren't enough troops to cover the real estate to begin with. Now, the other thing is that it is not immediately apparent that. Uh, this is a battle of survival. Well, the, you know, it, it, and it, it is not to begin with, you know, for there is a time when the, when the British are winning this battle. And indeed, in the extract I read from Smith Dorian, he pretty much suggests that. You know, um, talks about the Zulus wavering and talked about Zulu witnesses saying that, you know, they, they, were, they were suffering. Um, and, and of course, that's well supported in all sorts of other evidence from, from the Zulu side. Um, but it will migrate to become a battle of survival for the British. So every, every part of that conversation that you've alluded to is uh, with the benefit of hindsight not given to Colonel Pulling. So he had no idea that he would have to fight a battle of survival. Um, uh, and you know he he almost won the Battle of Isandwana. You know if the, if the Zulu if he, if they kept their uh, if the position had held its uh, held, if the line had been held for another fifteen minutes, probably the Zulus would have turned around and disengaged, and he would have been presented with a victory. And and this whole conversation uh, would not even be uh, on the table. But this withdrawal takes place and, and the whole thing leads to a catastrophic um, collapse of, of integrity across the force as a whole. And so the battle of survival is forced upon them. And I think it's pretty clear that uh, Poulain is aiming to form a square. 
uh, by ordering the um, bugle to sound retire. Uh, he wants his uh, company commanders to uh, converge on the center, as it were, whilst withdrawing at the same time, so making ground inwards to the saddle and converging, where his only tactic will be to form square. You know, it's, it's all he can do. So that, that is what is afoot, um, you know, when the whole thing uh, reaches its climax and, uh, 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 and the British are are overpowered so he's that's that's his goal is to form square but of course he doesn't have the opportunity to do that um and so you're left to the the companies really forming rallying squares and, and that's why they last as long as they do because they are in uh, these little tight packed formations between 60 and 80 men shoulder to shoulder in a circle all around the fence quite difficult to break into so he's trying to form square, but he, so the, the sort of, um, those commenting with the, um, with the benefit of hindsight, as one would put it, you know, he, he can't simply form a square at the start of the battle, because to do so would be to surrender the camp, the number three column camp, to the Zulu army. You know, he's got to cover the real estate. He's got to defend the camp. Uh, so it's a, that's really a sort of a, you know, there's, no, there's nothing in that, com that conversation. He can't form a square because he's got to, his mission is to defend the camp. And he only attempts to form a square when he realizes actually, <clears throat> If, I, if we're going to lose all these wagons and all these tents and all these stores and the things that I'm assigned to guard, better that than that everybody is killed. That's, that's when you know, he's got a battle of survival on his hands, but, but not at any point prior to that. And that's when sort of the forming square comes into it. Um, what was the other part of your question? Well, the... Um... <clears throat> We started by talking about the validity um, the, of any other types of um, formations so wagon or, 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 or locations or techniques you could have been used. Yeah, yeah, wagon lagers would be a good one. Um, there's no question, but that the British were warned by the uh, Afrikaners that they should employ wagon lagers, which is what Pretorius had done against uh, Dingaan's uh, regiments in uh, 1838 with great success. You know, they, they um, at Blood River, uh, something around anything up to between two and 3,000 Zulus were killed. And I think only three or four people were, were wounded on the Boer side, including uh, Pretorius himself. Uh, so that, but, but they, of course, had been armed with flintlock muskets or the Dutch uh, version, the, the ROER, they generally called them, um, R-O-E-R, which is sort of an 18th century flintlock. Um, and therefore, when you're talking about a, a sort of a, a weapon of that type, which is a, you know, takes you best part of 40 seconds probably to, to load, you know, you're gonna need some sort of barrier to stand behind against a fast moving, Zulu MP. So Pretorius knows exactly what he's doing. Chelmsford isn't in that position. The times have moved on. It's you know four decades later. Um, he's got this fantastic breech-loading, purpose-built rifle um, to compare with um, what the Boers have been armed with. In fact, if, I think it, Kruger is uh, himself. Paul Kruger is one of those who has a conversation with uh, the British about well uh, the use, utility of the wagon lager, but they don't accept it. They don't. Um, sign up to it uh, and it's easy to say that's through um that's through arrogance but that's like saying um oh uh you know it's like pretending that, that the bren gun hadn't been invented uh by dis by disregarding the martini henry we'd like pretending machine guns hadn't come along that sort of thing you know they had come along they were there they were a fact of life that was the standard firearm it has all the characteristics that you know about and it's a game changer in terms of 
um, fighting Zulus, you know, it should not be necessary to uh, lager your wagons. Um, and of course, the, the, um, the British are, are built in, and it's very much a problem of the Victorian army uh, across the era um, until I think 1888, that they don't have a professional logistic corps. So all logistics is um, uh, contracted. It's, uh, you know, slow, it's laborious, it's disorganized, it's uh, inconvenient, not very military. And so they have this problem. And so, so they've got these huge amounts, huge quantities of stores to move to sustain what, what is actually quite a large army divided admittedly into several columns, but still amounts in the totality to a large army. That all needs to be sustained using uh, the ox wagon. And, and the ox wagon is not the ideal um, transport vehicle. So they're always going to be um, rotating uh, wagons to go back down the lines of communication to the last depot, Smalls depot, uh, in order to bring stores up to the forward troops. Uh, uh, and that is already, that process has already started as early as this under which is the first camp inside Zululand. There are 50 wagons due to go back to Rourke's Drift uh, as, as the battle, uh, or as, as the 22nd of January dawns. Um, and that move is is cancelled because of um, the various deployments to Mangani and what have you. So even if they had made a lager, um, you know, there would be one, one side of it would be missing uh, because they were about to move off. But they just, they just you know, Chelmsford uh, and to some extent Glynn as well, just didn't think in those terms. There was, there was no intention to form lagers. Um, they did do it. Why it seems like a good idea is because, uh, same as fighting in square, they fought in square uh, Jinjin Luvu and, and that Ulundi because of Isandwana, because of the impact of Isandwana, because of the lessons that it taught. Um, and um, they also used uh, or would use a lager very effectively at uh, Kambula. Battle Kambula because of this and one and the lessons that it taught. But of course, Plain, Durnford, Chelmsford, the rest of them, they have not yet had the bloody nose. It, it takes the bloody nose for them to uh, realize actually we've gone about this the wrong way. We've been we've been we've been complacent here. We you know we sh we should be using wagon lagers. We should um, It'd be fighting in very tight, compact formations. But it is Isandwana that teaches that uh, lesson or those lessons. Um, and and it's, un it's unreasonable to say, well, they should have known that anyway, right from the outset. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, I guess another uh, sort of adjunct to that discussion is would there have been a better spot to fight from in terms of the ground? Um, there's often talk of, you know, should have been on top of Islandwana itself or on a high feature or something along those lines. Um, is there any sort of validity to that as well? No. Um, the, idea, <laughs> the idea of uh, 1,800 men <laughs> on top of Islandwana is, not to put too fine a point on it, preposterous. Um, you you could uh, make a, a defensive position around um, Malabam Cozy or Black's Copy, named after Major Black in the 24, which is to the right of the Saddle Road. Um, and indeed, they did do that uh, when they came back to Isandwana. Lord Chelmsford's people did that when they came back to Isandwana that night. But again, they were not, when the Battle of Isandwana started, when people were committed to ground, when assets were committed to ground, they were not fighting a battle of survival. They were just fighting a battle, um, which they intended to win. And they were using the formations that the drill book urged upon them that they had been using for the past uh, two years in the Ninth Cape Frontier War. Um, and as it turned out, it was unpicked by this, um, which is why we started this conversation by talking about the 
the tenets of, of Zulu maneuver, you know, and why it proved to be so effective. Now we, now we can see it all falling into place. Um, and again, the, the British sort of knew these things, and, and there was a, sort of a, a little pamphlet that talked about the Zulu tactics and the horns of the buffalo and the rest of it. But it's, you know, it's all very well, <laughs> it's all very well writing it in a pamphlet, but, you know, what, I mean, most of army officers would rather cut their arm off than read anything. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why you have, that's why you have glasses and two arms. <laughs> that's right, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, believe me, I've had great difficulties getting <laughs> some of my subalterns to read anything. <laughs> Um, I guess, given the fact that uh, I think the most salient point in listening to you uh, to, that I've picked out of that is that whole notion of battle of survival, that yeah. that yeah. it wasn't the intent going into it. And really, uh, I know that what commanding um, uh, individual would enter into a situation um, defaulting yeah. to, to thinking yeah. that way. That a battle yeah. survival is a reaction or a result of a failed plan or a compromised plan or or something that yeah. goes wrong. Not yeah. it's it's not your lead card. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Yeah. That uh, uh, that's perhaps the, the biggest thing is that it's this shift in in the reality on the ground that can't be sort of allotted for going into the battle. <clears throat> I guess uh, without changing the situation, however, uh, that Pauline was dealt with in terms of, you know, half the forces outside of the camp and off at the Mangani and whatnot. Um, was there any way in which those forces left in the camp uh, could have won the battle and continued the campaign? I, I, I had to think about... Um... The, the minimal force level that it takes to, or would have taken, to hold that piece of ground in a broadly linear formation. Uh, and, and in my, <coughs> excuse me, in my estimation, the, the minimum number of companies uh, that they would have needed is 10. They could have got away with 10. Um, and that's pretty much two to watch the back, entrance to the saddle, six in front, two to the left, and two to the right. No, that, that, that's 12. Um, sorry, four to the front, two left, two right, two behind. Um, that, was all, that was almost a segue into a Monty Python uh, uh, skit there for a second. <laughs> Our two chief weapons are fear and surprise. <laughs> two chief weapons, a fear, surprise, and a ruthless efficiency. Anyway, I digress. Shall we, shall, shall, yeah, anyway, 10. <laughs> um, I've completely lost my, let's uh, that's, read that's right now. Um, I'm sorry, it was that uh, we were talking about 10 companies to defend the camp. 10 companies to defend the camp. Um, yeah, and. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the bit I remember. <laughs> Um, I, the, the question was, uh, without changing the situation that Pauline was left with upon the departure of Chelmsford in the flying column in the early morning of the 22nd, is there any way in which the British forces left at Islandwana could have won the battle and continued the campaign? Yeah. yeah. Um, Ten companies minimum to do a decent job. And you could, you could substitute pairs of troops from the NNMC for a company in that equation. In other words, you could uh, leave all of Durnford's mounted troops to, to watch the, the back of the saddle, leaving the 24th to fight in front of the saddle. Um, and I think that would give you a tolerably uh, intact position but there would still be you know areas of weakness so you would pro you probably want people on um black's copy anyway uh but it, it would it would uh, and, and 
in Lord Chelmsford's defence, you know, I mean, he he's actually brought Burnford up to Nisandwana, perhaps even with this in mind of of covering the ground adequately. Uh, if Plain and Durnford had acted in unison, they might have got away with it. But once uh, the number two column assets, Durnford's command, start um, dissipating themselves around the battle space, that column can no longer play that uh, that supporting role, I think, to Plain's command. So the the gap is plugged and then it's opened again Dunford Dern, opens it again by heading off to do what, whatever he thinks he's doing um <clears throat> and that and that leaves what's left too thinly spread uh, and again I, I, the the whole sort of blame thing between Plain and Dunford is a is a spurious um conversation really because they're both doing their best and they didn't get it right. Um, but to what extent was Pelain drawn forward by Durnford's foray and, and the fact that um, the last words that passed between them was if, if you know, very well, I won't take the two companies, but if I get into trouble, I shall expect you to support me. You know, that's, <laughs> that's pretty naughty <laughs> because how, how can an infantry-based command support a column of uh, mounted troops without walking a long way uh, rather more quickly than would be comfortable? Uh, it, it, can't, it can't really be done at all. You know, the infantry companies can't support cavalry in that way. And it was certainly infringing the act strictly on the defensive um, injunction uh, placed upon Pelain. Uh, but probably it played a role in in him electing to take up position on, on the Rocky Ridge as opposed to close in on the camp, um, which would have given him more. He would have had a, a longer range view of the attack uh, from a more commanding viewpoint and might have been able to contract his frontage uh, a lot earlier than he was able, you know, through the, essentially, when you wouldn't call it a failed withdrawal because it actually, you know, they did pretty well, did accomplish as much as they did with it. But um, had, had, they, had their start point been that much closer to the mountain, then they might have coalesced uh, much, more er, much more early and more, uh, and, and to better effect. But that opportunity was denied by the fact that they had to go forward to support uh, Durnford in some way. Um, you've got to bear in mind that until um, Durnford uh, arrives in the camp and starts uh, uh, sending people out of it, you know, Pulling has done nothing twice. Um, so he literally lived up to his um, act strictly on the defensive orders. He did it with the eight o'clock alarm. Uh, the eight o'clock stand to and the 10 ish, 9 30 ish, 10 ish stand to. On both occasions, he does nothing except form up the troops at the foot of the mountain. And that speaks strongly uh, in his defense in terms of culpability. In other words, had Durnford not uh, pressured him into um, supporting him on the, in the forward area, one can only assume that he would still have been back on the camp when the balloon um, went up and in a much better position to, to, to fight this battle of survival once he realized the necessity for it. One of the interesting points in just listening to you here is that that whole notion of defending the camp, um, you talked a little bit about the numbers of troops that you figure would have been the minimum to do so which of course he was denuded of, he didn't have even the minimum number, um, is the fact that once that battle of survival sort of begins and it's a question of the manpower and saving the manpower of it, is you've essentially had to abandon your mission, which was to defend the camp, which is yeah. the, the, the physical camp, the, the not, not just the ground, but 
the tentage, the wagons, the, yeah. the stores, the everything. Uh, and in, in, in uh, adopting a formation or uh, a location that is not the camp, you have then surrendered it to the enemy and your mission is now void. Yeah. Um, that even if you are to survive, well, this camp has been ransacked and burnt and destroyed. Um, if you had been able to fight your way back towards Rourke's Drift or simply made a stand and the Zulus swarmed around and then left, they'd still destroy the camp in the process of doing that. And I think that may have something to do with like the logistical side of things, which is something perhaps isn't quite as, as often discussed is that in losing the camp is the actual effect on the campaign Mm. as losing all the manpower that happened historically would that have been a similar kind of greater effect in terms of stalling it and stopping it it, it would have been a complete showstopper i mean uh, chelmsford's force at mangani has got nothing everything logistic is it is anwana um so he only uh, could only have done what he was forced to do which is turn around and go back home again um, and then plan a second invasion, which uh, could not get underway for some months. Um, the loss of the camp would necessarily have always entailed that, even if some significant part of, of the first 24th, say, had been able to survive. Um, you know, that, that doesn't help. If you've lost your entire logistic echelon, um, you haven't got an army anymore. You can't operate. Um, so, yeah, it would have been a knockout blow. To, to lose control of, of, of the logistic installation that was the camp at Isanwana. When you, when I personally sort of bring, and as I'm listening, uh, to explain it all, and these different aspects come together, and you realize that the way the situation unfolded is uh, with this massive area to defend and not enough men to do so, a developing situation with the enemy that becomes apparent that there's you know so many more than they perhaps were expecting and they're maneuvering in the way they do all of a sudden all these things are coming to play all at once and yes as you alluded to that there is this moment where the survival kick there's instinct if you will does kick in and they try yeah so it's a question of the timing and and the, the time and space and it obviously <laughs> it doesn't work out in that sense and it yeah. doesn't work out in both the survival and the defending of the camp and mm. the, 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 the battle becomes sort of what we all know it to be. Um, but it, it, that could have, should have, would a piece to the conversation in the greater context of, you know, internet discussions and whatnot. It, it always seems to, to come home that, oh, they should have done this, or if they'd done this, they would have won. But it no. brings that whole logistical piece into it is that if they had formed square originally and fought out on the plane or in the saddle, that they wouldn't have been able to even see half the camp from that location, yep. which would have then been ransacked by the Zulus on their approach to close with the British. So yep. it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult situation, certainly, to, to try and piece together that way and figure out what should have happened. Indeed, yeah. I, I, I think you summed that up very nicely, yeah, I agree. <clears throat> There's a, I guess this is more of a, uh, we move the discussion into a little bit less on the, the ground, the tactic side, and sort of now take a step back from, from those aspects. Mm. Uh, this, the story of the battle is obviously full of anecdotes and events that speak to great bravery and, and courage on, on both sides. Uh, when we speak of the recognition of these events and, and those involved, the subject sort of turns, mm, well, it turns to the award of a number of what most people will be familiar with, the Victoria Cross, um, for acts of all these, uh, the acts of, of, of bravery. Uh, and two in particular, those awarded to Melville and Coghill, um, have at times um, come under some degree of scrutiny. I, I suspect that this has something to do with the fact that they, well, they, they left the camp. And I was wondering if you just put maybe a bit of a, put some clarity, a bit of background to perhaps uh, dispelling any of this scrutiny if it in, is indeed uh, warranted uh yeah um it, it, it does come up um and it it comes up 
it came up uh, contemporaneously when uh, a particular bet noir mine, Garnet Wolseley, um, slated uh, the award of, of these Victoria Crosses. But of course, he slated almost everybody for almost anything he could think of um, because he was a, a, a nasty piece of work. Um, he slated the award of Victoria Crosses to the private soldiers in the hospital at Royal Shift because they were pinned like rats in a hole. Um, you know, so you couldn't please Walsley, um, mainly because he didn't have a VC and he'd been trying very, very hard to win one. In fact, he got very And he, he distinctly disapproved of Melville and Cockle getting the VC. But, you know, he was not, uh, he did not represent any sort of bow wave of opinion. You know, the, the, the uh, army generally uh, was content that those VCs should be awarded. Uh, uh, and of course, they were awarded on the basis that it was written up at the time. Had they lived, they would have been awarded the Victoria Cross. They didn't actually get awarded them until 1907, 28 years later, when uh, the first posthumous VCs were signed up to by the king. Um, and they were uh, they were the first or amongst the first. I think there were one or two others at the same time. Uh, anyway, and the fact of the matter is that you get the VC for, um, generally speaking, for uh, laying down your life or running the risk of laying down your life for somebody else uh, with the odds hugely stacked against you. And um, it, is, it is easy to uh, make a case for both Melville and Corkill based on that um, set of criteria. Corkhill uh, had very badly injured his knee in a fall from a horse, faintly preposterously, but whilst chasing a chicken uh, a couple of days earlier. But he couldn't. He couldn't stand. He couldn't walk. Uh, and he, like um, all, all the other people who were mounted, uh, as we've already discussed, became part of that uh, wave of fugitives who, who went out through the back of the camp. Melville um, left somewhat later uh, and was and had the Queen's colour of the 1st Battalion with him. But they, they certainly didn't leave together, but they came together during the um, uh, flight to Fugitive's Drift, as it, as it subsequently became known. Um, and uh, Cockhill got clean across the river um, into Natal. Um, but on looking behind him, observed that Melville had been swept off his horse uh, and was stuck in the middle of the river, clinging to a rock, still holding on to the uh, Queen's colour. And so Cockhill turned his horse about and went back into the river to help Melville and to assist with the Queen's colour of his battalion. That moment when he turns the horse back into the river is a VC qualifying act. He's safe. He's in the tunnel. He's got away from the Battle of Isandwana. But no, he turns around and goes back into danger at great risk to his life to rescue the adjutant. So that's how you um, perfectly satisfactorily justify the award of a VC to Corkill. Then, and I know you've been there, at least, have you been to the graves of Melville and Corkill when you were there? Yeah. I have, yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, you know full well how far up the hillside their graves are from the River Buffalo, from the banks of the River Buffalo. A very steep slope. You can't go there without blowing out of your backside by the time you reach it um, on a hot day. It's extremely steep. They get a long way up that slope. It must be 800 yards from the river, up, up, a, up a precipice, really. Um, and of course, Coghill can't have done that himself. And we know he didn't do that, but he couldn't walk. So um, Melville, having got into the tile, again, is safe. But instead of heading off and making it clean away from the, the battlefield, of Isandwana. He sticks by his brother officer, Colkill, and helps him 
for an extended period of time with the enemy on all quarters up that hillside until eventually they're so exhausted they can go no further and they put their uh, backs to a rock uh, as they're surrounded and defend themselves and are killed. So in both instances, they each gave the life for their lives for the other man. In both instances, the award of the Victoria Cross is justifiable because you essentially lay down your life for somebody else. If that's not valour, Garnet Wolseley, then I don't know what is. So um, good luck, Sir Garnet, and on your on your bike. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, uh, uh, yeah, as you, um, it was a very straightforward question. Uh, uh, does uh, it deal with sorry. the, uh, the, that sort of, it doesn't often, I would, compared to some of the myths and misconceptions we've talked about already, it's not one of those ones that predominates, but it's certainly something I think is worth addressing. Um, yeah. the, the circumstances of them leaving the camp and perhaps that comes into play with uh, um, whether or not they should have won or not. Um, but I mean, you've laid out the, the, the criteria and the situation and the actions of both and uh, certainly answered the question for sure. People who uh, would contend that have never been in a battle at the mortal risk of their lives, shall we say. Sure. <laughs> uh, and of course, the internet is, is the domain of, the, uh, of, of uh, the Walter Mitty, shall we say. So it's full of heroes. Um, but you, you know, you and I know that the, there are rather fewer heroes in the world than there are on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> sort of moving away from the, the 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 actual battle proper, there's some few things that that enter into the conversation, not necessarily just about this land of but certainly um, that's part of it. Um, the 24th is very often associated with Wales um, and in some circles assumed to have been very Welsh in nature. Um, as some may also be aware, the 24th at the time also had a territorial title as part of its name, uh, this being the moniker Second Warwickshire. Uh, on the surface, this appears to be a little bit confusing. Uh, and for the benefit of those outside of the UK, that Warwickshire is not in Wales. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on this sort of oh, apparent dichotomy and maybe rationalize that that Welshness, as I make my fingers in air quotes, of the 24th of the late 1870s. Mm. Um, well, for those outside the UK, Warwickshire is, you can visualize it best by saying that Birmingham is in Warwickshire, by and large, uh, uh, I think. <laughs> But it's in it's in the Midlands, um, so it's, a, it's some significant distance from Wales. Um, and to be absolutely precise, the regiment in 1879 was called the 24th Brackets Second Warwickshire Close Brackets Regiment of Foot. It was um, neither Welsh nor English, or neither Welsh nor from Warwickshire. Uh, importantly, it had never been from Warwickshire because, um, again, part of these sort of internet conversations that, uh, I mean, we all know that the internet is, is, can be a pretty vicious place. Nothing more vicious between the English and the Welsh and the English and the Scots and the English and the Irish, you know, it, uh, there, there is no, there's no more fearful conversation to be involved in. Um, and um, so the whole business of Rourke's Drift, which all Brits are proud of, you know, as epitomizing, um, if you will, the, the best of the national character. Everybody wants a bit of the action. So the English want to do down the Welsh and the Welsh want to do down the English. And everybody wants to claim it as part of their own. Um, and... Um, so Stanley Baker was particularly naughty, <laughs> great, great actor, bad historian, when he made Zulu with, with the sort of the singing of Men of Harlech and all the rest of it, that, that gets up the nose of quite a lot of English people who know that this is the second Warwickshire. What it will become, of course, in 1881, 
is the South Wales borders. And the key, which is why uh, Stanley Baker, uh, in fact, it, the, the film script alludes to the South Wales borders or the narrative bit at the, at the end alludes to the South Wales borders, which it was not called for another two years. Um, but the key issue is um, the business of localization and recruiting. In particular, the Localization Act of 1871, I think it was. If it wasn't 1871, it was 1870. It's part of the Cardwell reforms at the beginning of the decade. Let's just clear, clear up the sort of second Warwickshire thing. Those county titles um, were adopted by and large uh, in all the more senior regiments in 1782. And they had, um, they had only fleeting substance, if any at all, and that very soon faded because um, recruiting was not localized. So you did not join your local regiment, partly because all the regiments were mobile around this country around Ireland around the world globally um, all the time and they, they moved with really quite astonishing rapidity from one station to another so there was no um, fixed depot system and of course a depot is where you train your recruits and you, you produce the lifeblood of the regiment that, that goes on and on and on and, on and perpetuates the regiment um, and we're all used to a system, a modern system, a regimental system, as they allude to, uh, in which everybody from the same area joins a particular regiment. And, that, and that's called localization, where the recruiting area is tied to the, the geographical area uh, uh, is tied to the cap badge. And that did not happen until the Localization Act of 1871. Now, The mo all the, um, the the most senior regiments, the, the top twenty five regiments of the line, had two battalions at that juncture. Everything from the twenty fifth of foot upwards had only one battalion. They were single battalion regiments. But when they um, uh, the sort of army reformers visualized a new regimental system at the beginning of the Cardwell reforms. They wanted two battalion regiments on, on, the, on the basis that one would be at home, recruiting and training, and the other one would be serving overseas, holding the empire. So the system had to have two battalion regiments. Single battalion regiments were of no use to them. So the plan was hatched that all the regiments above the 25th regiment of foot would be amalgamated in pairs to, to, for, to become new regiments. And all the numbers in use anywhere would disappear. So there would be no 24th Regiment of Foot, there would be no 28th Regiment of Foot, there would be no 61st Regiment of Foot, etc., etc., etc. They would all have new titles, um, which would ref, ref, reflect by and large uh, their new regional affiliations. And they were all as part of the Cardwell reforms, allocated a new uh, recruiting area, a geographic area with which they, as a regiment, should be affiliated. Now, there was going to be blood on the carpet, because there always is when you amalgamate two regiments, and every regiment, and there was something like, you know, there was a 106th of foot, was probably the highest of foot that there was. Everything from the 25th foot to the 106th of foot was going to be smashed together in pairs all the way up the line to produce new regiments with no, really not paying any attention at all to what their old county titles were. Um, because they were, they were effectively brand new identities. Now, when they farmed out the geographical areas in 1871 at the beginning of that process, the 24th was allocated um, uh, Monmouthshire, Brecknershire, Radnorshire, and Montgomeryshire. And they are essentially the four counties of Wales that run up the right-hand side of Wales, as you look at the map, the eastern side, uh, along the border from South Wales to North Wales, from 
call it from Chepstow to, I don't know, Chester, uh, that, that line there. Hence the name South Wales Borderers. And, and that happened, that new uh, geographical affiliation happened in uh, right at the start of the Cardwell reforms. And in 1873, a new depot was established at Brecon in Mid Wales, in Brecknockshire. Um, but they didn't change uh, be because they had to put off uh, the abandonment of the numbers and the changing of all the old county titles and, until eight, because of, there were amalgamations involved, they had to put that off for a number of years so that people could calm down. I mean, this generally tends to happen. You know, all the sort of vested interests can calm down, try to come together, try to come to a accommodation, decide what their new cat badge is going to be, decide what their new name is going to be. The first 25 regiments weren't affected by that. But everybody else was so they like politicians always will they sort of <laughs> sidestep the issue said right we'll do that in 1881 then well, that's when all the regiments above 25 will get turned over to become something else so there is if you will an interregnum between 1871 and 1881 when the 24th regiment because it is lower than 25 is a two battalion regiment has become a Welsh regiment, but still has uh, an English title, a manifestly English title. Um, now, you don't, uh, at that point, kick all the people out who are already in the regiment and recruit new ones. Obviously, there's a, there's a period of transition. So that is where we are. That's where 1879 sits. It sits in that period of transition where uh, the regiment was assuming its new localized identity and would eventually in 1881 along with everybody else change its name to reflect its new identity so that's what i mean by it being a welsh regiment with an english title it's in a process of transition now uh, so, but the point being that it's full of englishmen it's full of irishmen and it's full of welshmen probably not that many scots um, because all the regiments uh, were, obviously the Scottish regiments had the, had the Scotsmen in, um, but any regiment of the line is full of Englishmen, Irishmen and Welshmen. There's also a, a sort of a high degree of um, uh, mobility arising out of the Industrial Revolution. So there's quite a lot of, quite a lot of Welsh people in London, in, in Birmingham, for example, uh, there's quite a lot of Irishmen in Birmingham. There's a lot of Irishmen in Wales. So when you, because of the uh, iron uh, industry and increasingly the coal uh, is sort of coming up, but um, people, a lot of people move around Victorian Britain for work. So where somebody was born, you know, their place of birth on their birth certificate doesn't necessarily reflect their cultural uh, uh, affinity so lots 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 of people living in the welsh valley the south wales valleys who are actually of irish extraction you see what i mean so um and, and quite often that gets after a couple of generations that gets forgotten about so quite a lot of the fiercely patriotic south walians today actually have irish lineages um so that's why i don't like this um conversation to get too xenophobic which it does uh, it, it shouldn't because we're all citizens of the same country you know the united kingdom great britain and northern ireland uh, and formerly great britain and ireland full stop um so there there isn't any room for for sort of petty xenophobia and the defenders of rourke's jeff were, were british soldiers some of them were welsh some of them were irish some of them were english what happens from 1873 to 1879 is that the new depot, which is called the 25th Brigade Depot, confusingly, don't ask me why, but it just was 25th, not connected to the 24th, 25th Brigade Depot is the depot of the 24th Regiment, only the Brits could do that, couldn't they? Um, each year it has to provide a 
company worth of brand new recruits, men recruited into the army, to the battalion uh, serving overseas. In this instance, the first battalion has been in South Africa since 1874. So in each of those years, 1874, five, six, seven, eight, a company's worth of new recruits who have been recruited under the localization system, who are theoretically Welshmen, but might be Irish, as I've already discussed, are joining a regiment which is partly English, partly Welsh, partly Irish already, uh, and making it increasingly Welsh between 1873 and 1879, but the name has still not changed, uh, and it's that that confuses people. What I'll do is I'll read you a letter from Colonel Henry de Gage, the brother of William. So William de Gage is killed with the 1st Battalion as a captain. His brother, Henry, is a Lieutenant Colonel, the commanding officer of the 2nd Battalion. And he's the commanding officer of the men that uh, fought at um, Old Trift. Sir, on behalf, this is addressed to the, uh, the mayor and corporation at Brecon and is from Colonel uh, de Gage. Dated Rourke's Rift Natal, 28th of April, 1879. Sir, on behalf of the officers, non-commissioned officers and men of the 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment, I beg to thank you and the gentlemen of the borough of Brecon for the vote of condolence transmitted to me by the officer commanding the 25th Brigade Depot and which I have caused to be published in this night's regimental orders. I cannot close this letter without expressing to you the high esteem which I, in common with all the officers of the regiment, hold the soldier-like qualities of the gallant fellows I have the honour to command and who are now mostly your countrymen. No officer need wish to lead better and to His Excellency Lord Chelmsford words to me when speaking of the steady determined conduct of the men on the fearful night of the 22nd of January, it was admirable. No troops could have done better. I am pleased to tell you that three of your countrymen have been recommended to Her Gracious Majesty the Queen for the honour of the Victoria Cross, and a fourth, 1398 Private Joseph Williams of Monmouthshire, South Wales, would most, certain, would most certainly have been recommended had the poor fellow been spared to reap the reward of his conspicuous gallantry at the defence of Rourke Shift. I have the honour to be, sir, your worship's obedient servant, H.G. de Gage, Lieutenant Colonel, commanding 2nd 24th Regiment. So that's the commanding officer writing from Rolf's Drift in April and using the phrase about his soldiers who are mostly your countrymen to the mayor of Brecon. Okay, so that's pretty powerful testimony. Now, you can then look at the regimental records, which are incomplete. Um, quite a lot of the, of the stuff uh, related to the first battalion was actually lost to this and Wana. But a lot of, you know, there have been various attempts to look at places of birth and places of attestation where the bloke puts his hand up before the magistrate and says, I swear I, I don't have a criminal record, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and I'm a right on for the army sort of thing. Um, uh, that does not indicate the man's cultural affinity. It indicates where he took his oath in front of the magistrate. Doesn't mean anything else. So you can have Welshmen giving the, taking the oath in any part of the country, you can have Irishmen taking the oath in Wales, et cetera, et cetera. So it's meaningless in terms of, of, um, of, of nailing this issue down. How many Irishmen, how many Englishmen, how many Welshmen? Um, uh, and then you get, the so sort of, because it, this exercise is mostly undertaken by xenophobes, you get the sort of the low tactics like, um, claiming that Monmouthshire is not part of Wales, which I think technically it might not have been in 1879. But there's a letter from Colonel, Colonel de Gage here that says Monmouthshire, South Wales, you know. that's uh, I was born in Monmouthshire. It's in Wales, believe me. Uh, so uh, that sort of low tactic really won't cut the mustard. My sense of it, to cut to the chase, is that the 24th Regiment of Foot was about half and half Welsh and English, which is a sort of a diplomatic answer. I think that actually quite a lot of, well, a lot of people have been regionally recruited in South Wales um, prior to 1879, as reflected by Colonel de Gage's 
let, letter to, to the mayor of Brecon, whether it amounted to 51%, 49%, 53%, 64%, nobody can say. Um, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> right. In, in the big picture, I think you just did that last piece is yeah. what, you're, what you're talking it, it doesn't really very much a cosmopolitan regiment as they all were at the time mm. or the mm. vast majority were anyway in yeah, transition yeah. into a regional one yeah 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 with that transition being fairly advanced but not complete absolutely yeah 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 This battle and works drift and actions of the, of the Zulu War, uh, you know, have a huge tie to the 24th and its uh, subsidiary, or not subsidiary, but the, the subsequent regiments that it became. Um, yeah. The South Wales borders being the uh, title given to it in 1881, as you alluded to. Mm. Um, <clears throat> since then, that regiment has been amalgamated and amalgamated again as the, the army has gone through its various reforms uh, throughout the years. Uh, but these two actions, the Island Duana and Works Drift, uh, you know, are hugely significant, or from the outsider would appear to be hugely significant um, to this regiment in particular. Uh, and I presume that they're recognized or memorialized to some degree with in the current regiment, which the name of which is the Royal Welsh, but also mm -hmm. its immediate antecedent, uh, which would have been the Royal Regiment of Wales mm -hmm. as one of them, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was in both of those, the Royal Regiment of Wales initially, obviously, brackets 24th, 41st of foot, and the Royal Welsh latterly for the last, whatever it was, six years of my career. So yes, I can speak to, to both those organisations, and they, they both uh, very much celebrate uh, the 26th of January, which is a regimental day. Um, and, uh, you know, we have all sorts of interesting uh, relics of, of 1879, um, probably the most important uh, aspect of this whole thing is the wreath of immortals, which uh, is born on the Queen's colour of the regiment. Um, because in uh, 1880, I think it was, Queen Victoria present, asked to see the colours saved by Melville and Colkill, and they were taken uh, to Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. That's a good photograph of that. Uh, which you can get off one of my pages, I'm sure. <laughs> that, that was the colour party that took took the colour to uh, Osborne House. And the Queen uh, decorated it with, with this wreath of immortelles, which is a, a wreath of real flowers, um, uh, and, there, and commanded that such a thing should be borne on the pike staff in perpetuity. So ever since they've been struck in silver. So, uh, uh, and that's a unique distinction. So it's the only regiment where you will see this uh, wreath of immortelles on the pike staff of the Queen's colour. So that's absolutely, uh, that still goes on today. It's still there in perpetuity, in perpetuity means exactly that. And uh, so the Queen's colour of the Royal, the latest Queen's colour of the Royal Welsh has, has a silver wreath. Um, Coghill sword uh, is always suspended between the two colours in the officer's uh, dining room. Um, there's a lovely, uh, cigar box uh, presented uh, by Sir Bartle Freer, of all people. Very large and generous gift, uh, you know, this sort of size. Um, <clears throat> which was presented to uh, the 1st Battalion when the 9th Cape Frontier War was on and he was uh, sort of permanently living in the officer's mess in um, King Williamstown uh, in the Eastern Cape. And as a token of his um, appreciation of their hospitality shown to him, he, he presented this cigar case, uh, uh, cigar box, which is a lovely thing, as I say. And, it, um, you know, when you open the Silver Room of many regiments, there are lots of interesting things in there, but you, you don't, you know, Sir Bartle Freer is an important historical figure. Uh, and you sort of do a sort of a double take when you see inscriptions in, in the silver of names like that. Um, yes, it, it's it, of enormous significance, and uh, of course, it is absolutely essential to the Welsh military identity as it exists today. I mean, there are not that many uh, 
Welsh units left. There's the Queen's Dragoon Guards, the Welsh Guards, uh, uh, and the Royal Welsh. Possibly there might be some artillery and engineers. I'm not entirely sure. Um, and I, I've probably said that I probably led myself into the wrong uh, uh, into a trap now. But uh, if there are, I apologise to them. But the QDG, the Welsh Guards, and the Royal Welsh. Even those other regiments who have nothing to do with uh, uh, the Royal Welsh, you know, feel a glow when Rorkshift is mentioned and, and, and the, all those Victoria Crosses and what have you. So yes, it's, it's of huge importance to modern soldiers today. And it, re it remains very much a, the thing that you appeal to as a leader of men, you know, remember Rorkshift and uh, don't let the side down. Uh, would there be, uh, when you say the 22nd is the regimental day, is there a parade or something along those lines that happens? Every yeah, so, yeah, there's, a, there's almost always a parade. And, uh, you know, I think, I, I can't really remember the, the days where we go through the abominable custom of serving um, gunfire to the troops in their beds in the morning. Uh, I think that's I think that's probably more March the 1st of David's day. But uh, I don't doubt that it would have been done on Rock Shift Day at various points and Advance of the world, right? Uh, interestingly, of course, um, the, the there are people now, friends of mine, who will tell you they were in the twenty fourth, uh, because when uh, they weren't, but they think they were, um, uh, be because um, the South Wales Borders had first and second battalions, um, they had no. Um, clash of identities so they although the officially all the numbers were dispensed with you can say that as many times if you you like if you're a politician i'm not going to make a blindly difference to a soldier you know they were as far as they were concerned in the 24 so although the number officially disappeared it didn't really so they continued to refer, the south Wales waters continue to refer to themselves as the 24th um uh, uh until they were dispensed with in 1967, they amalgamated with the Welsh Regiment to produce the um, Royal Regiment of Wales, brackets 24th, 41st of foot. So, um, and, and at which point the number is actually reinterjected into the army list again. So although at one point all the numbers have been done away with, actually those two come back when the Royal Regiment of Wales is formed in 1969. Hmm. So, but people don't really understand army traditions, do they? <laughs> they know what they're doing from one minute to the next, to be honest. Especially the intricacies of the regimental system. <clears throat> Keep them guessing, I say. <laughs> this sort of brings us to the conclusion of our discussion that centers around you know, Islam Dwana. Um, and I, it's from beginning to end, very, I, I think, very comprehensive. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time, uh, especially in this, our, uh, our, our, re, our reshoot, our re-talk, if you will, based on the earlier technical difficulties. Um, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to perhaps uh, stop talking about the past and the history and have an opportunity to talk a little bit about yourself and uh, perhaps let our viewers and, and those that might be interested in, in your activities, what you are up to at this point in time. Uh, well, um, I'm busily, I'm trying to write a book, but <laughs> I've uh, been writing it for a fearfully long time. And of course, um, the pandemic affair has not helped uh, in, in terms of getting to key archives and what have you. So um, I think I'm probably now in the, at least the fourth year of writing this book when it should really have been over in two. Um, uh, and it will be about an interesting subject uh not much covered victorian military history of course and uh, it's the battle of berea in um lesotho which is that landlocked country uh landlocked by south africa the republic of south africa uh, where there was a big battle in uh december 20th of december 1852 um involving uh mishushwe's uh Basutu army and uh a much smaller british army under General Sir George Cathcart, as he became, though he was not Sir at that juncture. Um, uh, and the interesting thing about it is that uh, the pursuit of fort mounted. Um, uh, uh, and so this was a sort of a, a small British army of a, a few hundred men um, 
like about a, about a thousand in the divided into several columns because that always works, doesn't it? Uh, and so, because it always works, of course they came unstuck and they ended up in in, in a sort of tricky position. Um, uh, but you end up with uh, you know anything up to six thousand African cavalry uh, attacking a few hundred British infantry, uh, and again a a battle of survival. But it's a it, it's quite obscure and nobody's ever heard of it. So um, I wanted to sort of bring that back into the world of history, as it were, proper history, and uh, and, and give that some coverage. Uh, and then I've got my sort of Iron Duke miniatures thing going on, which is, produces um, glossy, not glossy, I don't know why I say glossy, uh, 28 millimeter uh, uh, metal war games figures um, for in, in, as part of the war games industry, which goes on and we, uh, you know, we battle on making things and hoping people will buy them. Well, I can, uh, um, <clears throat> I'm glad to hear that you're you're writing a book, continuing to work at it. Um, <laughs> as somebody who is admittedly a uh, someone who enjoys your work, you have um, exquisite taste. What's that? Sorry, <laughs> you have exquisite taste. Yeah. <laughs> well, the uh, as I say, greatly enjoyed um, what what you've put to paper, as it were. That the fact that there's something else coming out at some point in the future is a great yeah. thing to look forward to. Last piece I wanted to interject about. Iron Duke, and uh, although I'm not, you know, heavily embedded in the community, uh, the wargaming community, I have dabbled from time to time, and I know yeah. that one thing that I appreciate about the, the product that you're putting into the marketplace is its attention to detail as far as the poses, the, the, the sculpturing goes, is that from mm -hmm. someone who studies uh, drill books and, and tactics and that kind of thing of the Victorian age, um, in terms of um, not only the, the body of, of soldiers informed on the battlefield, but also the individual skills and drills that are used uh, and taught, is that to be familiar with those and then to turn around and see those exact evolutions <laughs> mimicked in the form of a wargaming figure, that the rifle butt is placed right next to the foot as it should be, as is written in the manual, and that the rifle is held or the musket is held at a certain angle or part of the body as it's alluded to in the manual is something that coming from where I come from, as far as my historical background, is something that is hugely appreciative. And it's something every time I see one of your posts out there, I can pick out all the little pieces uh, that I can see obviously came from even a cursory look at the book. And so I appreciate that in particular. <laughs> well, I'll tell you a... Um... A funny story it wasn't funny for um paul hicks who who's a world talent uh, when it comes to sculpting um and he did a whole shed full of, of people in the um let's be careful now shoulder, shouldered arms position is that the right expression shoulder arms that that is a position yes there are several versions of shouldered arms that, that older, <laughs> older and newer but the point is that is this hand here? I, the musket's in the in the left um, hand and arm. This hand here, and when Paul sculpted them, being used to sculpting more modern soldiers, he sculpted them, and there were there were quite a lot of these guys in this position because we did several different types of regiment with clenched fists down the seam of the trousers, and of course that's not the way it was. They actually had stretched fingers down the seam of the trousers. So poor fellow, I had to make him do them all again. <laughs> I'm not sure he's forgetting me yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's exactly the kind of thing, though, that, that I was alluding to, is that you've, looked at, <laughs> you've read something and there's obviously some inject into the process that has ended up with these figures that are, I, I don't know of any others that would match in sort of realism that, that yours do. So um, <clears throat> for what it's worth, I, you know, it's certainly appreciated. And uh, the attention to that is something that I really uh, take to heart. So, sir, um, I think that's going to conclude our talk. Um, as interesting as it's been, thank you so much for coming on the channel. I hope that uh, if you'd be interested in conducting such conversations again on perhaps different topics that you might be interested, uh, I know the audience so far has been exceptionally receptive to what you've had to offer. Well, it's my very great pleasure, and I wish you and you all your viewers the, the very best. Um, it, it's been fun. 
even if it has been slightly repetitive. <laughs> Excellent. This concludes part three of the South Africa series here on the channel. Part one, having dealt with the details of our trip, as well as some aspects of kit and clothing. Part two, the organization and tactics of the army. And part three, Islam Dwana. Part four will now commence, dealing with the Battle of Rourke's Drift. For all your Snyder or Martini reloading needs, talk to Martin at X-Ring Services. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page.